Good morning. Good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast on the Class today is dedicated in loving memory of Selim Moni Dahan, sponsored by Peggy and Morris Dahan and family. Hazaku Baruch. Also dedicated for a speedy and complete for Or Ben Simon, sponsored by his aunt Vered George. Also dedicated and sponsored by Yaakov Shirazi, who is the undisputed up oh, there's still not it. No, it needs the it needs the uh, the the adapter, the USB adapter. Um, that doesn't matter. I guess I'll just do it without. Thank you. I appreciate going upstairs though. The uh, the uh, um, the sponsored by the Rosh Chodesh King Yaakov Shirazi on the occasion of Rosh Chodesh Tevet. And sixth day of Hanukkah, uh, seventh candle we're going to be lighting uh, tonight. Last Sahaba Kobikukul for success in everything. Also dedicated uh, in honor of Rabbi Fari for his incredible teachings. Evan Masu Abonim, Haital Rosh Pina, Hanukkah Sameh Chodesh Tov, sponsored by Emmanuel Zara. I always show the sign when I have to give compliments to myself because I feel very awkward about doing it. Uh, so just so you know, I read the sign. Okay, also. Uh, I saw the sign over to my eyes. Dedicated for the continued health as well and the refuah shlema of Chana Bat Simafega and Eliyahu Shimon and Mazaf Wotone. And sponsored by David Ash in honor of you. you. And your unwavering commitment to doing good for the state of Israel, for others around you doing these challenging times today and every day. Let us begin, my friends. So, we have a, uh, a, very, interesting, uh, a very interesting custom amongst the Jewish people. And I want to talk about the custom for a second. Um, because of uh, the message that I think that it brings. Um, amongst the Jewish people on the days of, uh, of Hanukkah, what do we do? We have a song, and the song is called, I Had a Little Dreidel. Right? Famous song. In fact, uh, it was written by a certain, uh, a certain fellow who had a talent for writing little ditties, little short songs. And he wrote the song. It was originally called My Dreidel. A beautiful story. Uh, and this family... You know, who lived here, grew up here with this, uh, with their, uh, with their uh, grandfather having written the song. Eventually moved cross country uh, to the other side, to the west, to the west, uh, to the west coast. They were feeling a little bit lonely. They came to school, and uh, it was a parents and you know and children's evening or whatever. And uh, and the kid raises his hand when they start singing "Had a Little Dreidel," and the kid says, "My mother's grandfather wrote the song," and and the teacher says, "Sonny." Your mother's grandfather didn't write the song. This is a folk song of the Jewish people. It's been around forever. Uh, actually, you know, even before the creation of the world, you know, I Had a Little Dreidel was recorded somewhere, right? It's one of those songs. Nobody made it up. And the kid says, no, no. My mother's grandfather made it up. Anyway, she thinks the little kid is kind of, uh, you know, lying until finally the mother actually comes in and says, actually, he's not lying. This is my grandfather who wrote the song, this, that, and the other. And, uh, and it's a source of pride for our family. Anyway, okay, the teacher finishes. A little bit later that afternoon, she's teaching one of the other classes in the kindergarten, and she stays singing the song, and some kid raises his hand and says, you know, my great-grandfather wrote the song. And she's like, oh, me. Anyway, she says, well, you know, it's very interesting you say that uh, because there's someone else in the first class that said that their grandfather wrote the song. Fight, 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 okay? And uh, what's it called? And uh, turns out they wind up introducing themselves this mother who found and felt so alone on the other side of the country actually found a long lost cousin that she didn't know existed in the same school in the same grade for her children to play with uh, so the song spans generations but also brings back family but brings family back together now that's a nice little warm story about I had a little dreidel but we have this custom why do we have the custom to spin the dreidel so everybody knows the reason is uh, because uh, the Greeks, Yemach Shemam, they forbid the Jewish people from studying Torah. And when they forbid them from studying Torah, so what did the Jews do? Could a Jew stop learning Torah? A Jew could no sooner stop learning Torah than a fish could jump out of water. Using the famous Midrash, the famous uh, conversation of uh, Rabbi Akiva. When Rabbi Akiva was, ca- was, uh, was caught for teaching Torah, and they were going to kill him. Uh, so there's a fellow who has a conversation with this man called Papus ben Yehuda. And they're having this conversation. What are you doing? Why are you teaching Torah in public? Don't you know it will get you killed? Stop teaching Torah. You'll save your life. So Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva tells this man the story about a fish swimming in the, ocean, in the river and a fox telling the fish. They're trying to catch you, the fishermen. 
jump out of the water, get on my back, and I'll take you to safety. The fish says to the fox, you're supposed to be the most clever of all the animals, right? The most cunning. Don't you know, if I get out of the water, I'm dead anyway. My life source is in the water. The Jewish people's life source is Torah. Ki em chayenu, for they are our life. Orech yamenu, in the length of our days. Ubahem ne'ege yomam v'alayla, and then we will toil day and night. So a Jew cannot disconnect themselves from Torah. So they would go into the caves and the mountainside. And they would bring with them dreidels and study Torah. And when the Greeks would come searching and they would see or they would find them studying Torah, which carried the death penalty, they would hide the books in the cave somewhere and they would start playing dreidel, right, uh, with money. And it would look like the kids were just slacking off of school, you know, playing this uh, meaningless game. However, anyone who knows anything about a dreidel knows that there are two kinds of dreidels. One kind of dreidel that says, Nes Gadol, Haya, or... And one that says, Nes Gadol Aya, Sham. A great miracle occurred, Paul means here. And other one says, Nes Gadol Aya, Sham. A great miracle happened over there. I always thought it was quite interesting because it, it's a little reminiscent of the story of, uh, of, of, uh, of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Why? Our rabbis tell us that what caused the great miracles of leaving Egypt? One is, Shiloshinu et Shemam. They didn't change their names. The other ones, they didn't change their language. So it could be read, Nes Gadol Aya Shem. A great miracle was that they did not change their name. And Nes Gadol Aya Peh, the language that they spoke. Okay, but that's obviously not the literal interpretation, the literal meaning of these words. The word is, a miracle happened here. Where do you have the miracle happened here? Dreidels? They're made in Israel because the miracle happened here. The dreidels that are made for American audiences, right? Where, what do they say? great miracle happened there. They always tell the story of the, uh, the non-religious, you know, uh, JCC manager who orders these dreidels uh, from Israel because he wants to be supportive of Israel. The dreidels come and he calls him, he wants his money back because the dreidels are defective. They sent him Nes Gadol poor dreidels, uh, and he thought that, that's, that, they were, that it was, a, that it was a, a, a manufacturing mistake. But my friends, I think that there's a tremendous lesson in that as well. And this to me is always uh, a fascinating thing. Because if you think about it, there's many things that happen over there in Israel. And we say the blessing the same in the diaspora as we say it in Israel. How many times do we find that the language changes in Israel and the language should change over here? Usually we just say it as if we were there. That's, you know, that's what we say. So my friends, um, I want to ask you, uh, what uh, I want to ask you to consider perhaps that there's a reason why we have a very different language on one dreidel than on the other. And the reason I think is very powerful. It's not just that in Israel the miracle happened here, and in Chutzlar, it's outside of Israel, the miracle happened there. That's not the point. If we're doing it to commemorate what they did, on their dreidel, Ya'ani would have said, here. Right? So we should commemorate their dreidel. Listen carefully. I think what we're learning here is a, a global idea. The Gemara tells us in Masechet Baba Batra that a person who leaves Eretz Israel and comes to live in Chutz Laaretz, Dome Kemi She'en Lo Eloha. It's like he does not have a God, which sounds pretty intense. You move to Chutz Laaretz, you don't have a God? What does that mean? The Maharsha explains. That in Eretz Israel, that we say about the Pasuk, the Pasuk says about Eretz Israel, the eyes of God bah, are in the land of Israel. Are there from the beginning, years beginning till years end. God never takes his eye off of the land of Israel. The relationship between Eretz Israel and Akadosh Baruch Hu is, a, uh, is one without any separation. One without any intermediary. But in Chutz Laaretz, the lands that don't belong to the Jewish people, all the other lands of the earth, they are serviced by the angel which is dependent, uh, which is uh, uh, appointed upon that country. To be able to intercede on behalf of that nation in front of God. So when you moved from Israel, when you had a direct line, so to speak, to God, 
where God was taking care of your needs, where our God is the direct giver to that land, so to speak. And then you move to America, or to South Africa, or to France, or to Britain, doesn't make a difference where. Anywhere that is not Israel, you have to go through an intermediary. So Dome, it's as if, Kimisha Elo, he doesn't have a direct line to Eloha. My friends, that guy, that Gemara is teaching us an unbelievable expression, not just in the reality of the fact that you go through another agent, that you have to pay a broker's fee, Yani. What the Gemara is telling you, that laughter came from a broker. Another broker, <laughs> another broker was just smiling, but one of the brokers was laughing. Um, uh, Bezat Hashem, that's a sign that he's getting many broker's fees. Okay, my friends, I, I want to share... I want to share the deep meaning behind that Gemara. A person could be in Eretz Israel and be in Galut. And a person could be in Galut and be in Eretz Israel. Now what I'm trying to explain here is the Gemara tells us that the Bate Midrash, the Bate Knesiot, the synagogues and the Bet Midrashim that are sprinkled around Chutz Laaretz are built with a cornerstone from Israel. Now today, many people actually do that. They ship in a cornerstone from Israel to be able to make the Gemara literal. But aside from the literal interpretation, there's an element of the Bet Knesset which is linked to Eretz Israel. It's called Mikdash Me'at, a mini temple. And perhaps that's the source and the idea behind the, 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 the concept that when the Mashiach comes and we all go to Eretz Israel, we have a tradition that the synagogues are actually going to come with us to Israel. I always mention that my mother-in-law had in, our, in my mother-in-law's house, they used to be in the basement a minyan for many years. And then when she finally did renovation for so many, after so many years of having a minyan in the house, she said, is it maybe someone else could take a turn to have the synagogue in the house? My father-in-law said, we just renovated the whole house. Bezat Hashem Mashiach is going to come. Don't you want to live in the house that we just renovated? And if the minyan is in our basement, what's he going to do? Just take the basement without the house? The whole house is going to come to Israel. So my mother-in-law acquiesced, and the minyan is still there till this day. But my friends, always great when you could use a Gemara against your wife. Okay, the Gemara says something very beautiful. The Gemara is telling us over here that the synagogues will go back to Eretz Israel, Not because of some sort of booby prize, not because of anything else, but because of the fact that they were always a part of Eretz Israel. You can create Israel islands in Chutz La'aretz. And what is an Israel island? How do you bring Israel? How do you bring that to Galut? That is a mindset that a person has. What is the mindset? Nes Gadol Haya Po. Living in Eretz Israel, not just geographically, a person who lives in the land of Hashem, they're living in this earth as if they are living in God's earth. That person experiences Nes Gadol Ayapo. Hashem's miracles are here with him always. The nature of his life is miracles. The fact that he woke up in the morning is a miracle. Opened his eyes, took a breath. He is living with miracles. I read the most beautiful line in a beautiful book, a book by Rabbi Sutton, uh, called uh, uh, the book, is a book on Bitachon. It's the Bet HaLevi on Bitachon. So he wrote a book he, he, in English, annotated with notes. Beautiful. In there, he brings a story with Rev, uh, uh, Rev, um, Rev Aaron Leib Steinman, I believe it was. Very old man. And he came to the doctor. And the doctor says, after looking at the, this elderly man, you know, his elderly man, very, very old. And he says, you know, it's a miracle that you're alive. The rabbi smiled, they looked at that young doctor and he said, it's a miracle that you're alive. Nes gadol haya po. The rabbi lived in Eretz Yisrael, not just literally, but also figuratively. Even when he came to Chutz Laaretz, he lived in Eretz Yisrael. My friends, I want you to understand the power of that statement. However, there are some people that live a reality of nes gadol haya sham. Over there, over there could mean in another time. Over there can mean in another land. Over there can mean for another person, for tzaddikim, for other families. You know, they, I, they, they say a story which is one of the biggest Musar stories I ever heard in my whole life. 
rabbi gets into a car, into a cab, and the cab driver sees he's a religious rabbi, so he says to him, you know, I see that you're here, you're religious, this, that, the other, you know, when I was in the army, you know, there was this one guy, he had a snake wrapped around his foot, he was going to uh, poison a snake, he was going to be killed. Anyway, they, did, they called the, the, the mefaked, and there were two people that they were going to get to shoot the snake. One person was the best shot in the whole regiment. Uh, another guy was good, but not as good. You know, you missed the guy, forget about it, you killed him. Yeah, so what's the question? The question is that the guy who was the best shot in the regiment was a fellow who really hated the guy who had the snake wrapped around his leg. So that they're trying to decide what to do until finally they make a decision. Right, yeah, it sounds like it, yeah? <laughs> so anyway, so the guy comes running up, this religious guy says, listen, before you try this, before you have any of them shoot, let the guy say Shema Israel, Because we know that that's a, something that a person could say in a moment of danger. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. You say that God's in charge of everything. There's only one God in the world. And maybe something miraculous will happen. And the guy closes his eyes, he says Shema, like he never said Shema in his life. Shema Yisrael, like on the Muazin, like you know, from the, from the loudspeakers, you know. Says Shema with all of his heart. The snake runs away. Yani was a Hamas snake. Went back to the hole in the ground that he came from. Shali drowns there. Okay, you understand? The snake slithers away. And he says, the man says to the rabbi, he goes, and you know, made such an impact. That guy became religious just like you. The rabbi says, wow. He says, so tell me, are you religious? He says, no, no, rabbi. The snake was not wrapped around my foot. That story is the biggest musar you could ever hear in your life. It didn't happen, it didn't happen to me. Dib, you watched it. Is that what it's going to take? A snake coming and wrapping itself around your leg? A person who lives the life of Nes Gadol Sham, that's a person who's living in Galut. They're exiled from, not just from Israel, they're exiled from the presence of God. God is not present with them. Or for them. I feel like returning all the dreidels and getting Nesgadolaya Po. So why are we having Nesgadolaya Sham? I think it's supposed to prick you a little bit. You're supposed to feel when you, when you, you know, you spend the dreidel, right? What are you supposed to feel? What are you supposed to feel? I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. Because this place as a place engenders in me the statement, Nes Gadol Haya Sham. The snake wasn't wrapped around my leg. It didn't happen to me. Miracles don't happen to me. Miracles happen in books. Miracles happen to rabbis with long beards. Miracles don't happen to me. That person is a person who lives in Galut. When a person walks into the Beit Knesset, what does it say in almost every single Beit Knesset? Above the Aron Kodesh. Shiviti Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. I place God before me always. That statement is the slogan, is the strap line of Eretz Israel. My, my friends, I want to add to this. The Midrash tells us that there was a fundamental difference between Israel and Egypt. The Jews lived in Egypt, correct? In Egypt, the, Jewish, the, the, the Egyptians never looked up. You know why? Because the irrigation system of Egypt was an irrigation system that did not come from the heavens. It came from the Nile overflowing its banks. They built a sophisticated irrigation channel system where as the Nile would rise, the overflow of the river would go to the fields and the fields would, we, would be watered by the, the Nile. It helps us understand why the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. Why? Because the Nile provided for them. So the Jewish people for 210 years learned not to look up. Many people ask the question, why did God perform so many miracles in the desert? 
God is usually miracle averse. He wants to do the minimal amount of miracles you could ever do. By the way, I give, I mean, we've talked about this halakha many times. Let's say you have someone um, who, you know, nobody knows that they're not well. So until you tell everybody that they're not well, it's a much smaller miracle that they should get better. So actually, we don't run to tell people that this person is sick. Because now, the more people find out the person is sick, the harder it is, harder, for that to, to occur, because it's a miracle. God doesn't like to do miracles, unless they're necessary. There comes a point though, when you start telling everyone, we need you to pray, we say, ha this person is sick. Because even though it's classified as a miracle, at this point you need a miracle. So you'd rather have the prayers of the rabim. So it's a delicate thing. You always should ask a rabbi before you decide whether or not to tell people publicly to pray for someone. What you could do is quietly mention the name as an example without saying the word hachole, chacham uvadya says. So why does God do so many miracles in the desert? Miracles that are absolutely unnecessary. You know what God could have done? Instead of having bread poured down from the heavens, instead of having a movable be'er uh, Miriam, a, a well of Miriam traveling with the Jews, you know what God could have done? You know what He could have done? Instead of having anane hakavod that protected them from the sun and from the snakes and the scorpions, I have simple solutions for Hashem. Uh, he has not yet called me for, for advice on how to run His world. I don't know what He's waiting for. He probably has the wrong number. But I have great advice for God. You know what the great advice is? Uber Eats. Jewish people have no food? Uber Eats. Let them order food. Jews have been ordering takeout for millennia. We couldn't have started a little bit earlier. Let the people from, uh, from the other countries come and sell the Jews food. That's not, that's not doable. God, you want to... You want the Jewish people to be protected from the sun. No problem. Do you ever have cloudy days? I lived 13 years in London. Hashem, you knew how to make clouds in London. Make clouds in the desert. But not surrounding the Jewish people like a box where it's an obvious miracle. Just put them up in the heavens where it blocks the sun. Isn't this an obvious question? My friends, the answer is actually very, very simple and very powerful. When they get to Israel, the Jewish people live a reality, as many, many people who live in Israel will know, that water is scarce. And when rain comes from the heavens, they don't kvetch and complain, they say, Baruch Hashem. When rain comes in New York City, we cry. Why do we get upset? Uber surge pricing. You see, you win with Uber, you lose with Uber. Also, please make sure to check if the item is actually kosher on Uber Eats, even if it's in the kosher section. My friends, surge pricing, that's what, enough to get us to say we don't want your rain, Hashem. But if the Jews were going to move from water coming to your doorstep by itself to a reality where you needed to look to Hashem every day for a miracle that rain should fall from the heaven, they needed a transition period to learn to rely on miracles. So what did God do? He took them for 40 years of the desert and He took them on an intensive, miracle-believing course. Now I want to stress what this means. Every time you see the number 40, 40 always in every instance indicates rebirth. Okay, the creation of something new. A, a child, an, a, a, a fetus after 40 days we say you shouldn't be praying anymore for whether it should be a boy or a girl. Right? Because it is what it is, contrary to what people think today. Right? The mikveh is 40 sa'a, 40 measurements of water, because a new thing is reborn when, the, when you go into the mikveh for, for purity. Okay? The mabul, which was uh, a purification process, a rebirth process for the world, how long is it? 40 days. When the Jews move from being nations of the world to being Am Yisrael, the chosen people, how long is Moshe in the Shamaim? 40 days. Always 40 indicates rebirth. God was taking the Jews of Egypt, the Nes Gadol Haya Sham people, and turning them into Nes Gadol Haya poor people. My friends, that is something that you and I can become. 
But in order to do that, we need to refine our miracle receptors. We need to start paying attention to the wondrous things that are happening all around us. Wondrous. I was on the plane just now. And uh, as I'm, I get on the plane, they, you know, they, they give you a thing on El Al that you could upgrade, you could bid for an upgrade. All right, so I bid for an upgrade to premium economy, and they let me know that I won. I was kind of thinking, like, I really feel like you won El Al. <laughs> you had an empty seat. Some guy paid you extra money right before it. You didn't obligate yourselves to give him the seat. You know, it was up to you. I feel, feel like you won, but okay, I get in this thing. El Al. And I asked for my code, my Mahad, my special kosher meal. Um, and they say, oh, we don't have one for you. Why? Because last minute upgrade to premium economy doesn't have the meal because you needed it 48 hours before. So they can give you the old meal. They said, should I get you the old meal? I said, look, I'm not so hungry. You know, when, you know, you know when your kids tell you when it comes time for dinner, you're, they're like, I'm not so hungry. You bring out dessert. And what does every mother say? Oh, you're hungry for dessert. I wasn't so hungry for economy airline food. I'm just going to put that out there. You know, I feel like it's the food in the world that you work hardest for and gain least from. <laughs> no, you're like getting through bulletproof plastic. I feel like instead of sending ceramic vests to the soldiers, we should have sent those, those food from the economy class. Right? That's right. Either way, so I don't know, I wasn't in the mood, so I said, look, if there's something, let me know. She says, oh, there's nothing extra. I said, okay, so you could check in business class if there's an extra one, and if there is. Anyway, both meals, the evening meal and the next and the late one, there was someone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Someone in business class who didn't eat their meal. So, they, uh, so she brought it to me. The second time she brought it to me, this non-religious El Al stewardess says, I could see that you have faith. You didn't give up. You believed that there was something there for you. You didn't give in. You didn't settle for the thing that you didn't want. You believed it was coming. And look, God made it come for you. You see, even a non-religious El Al stewardess doesn't say, I made it come for you. Doesn't say that a guy didn't eat because he's sleeping because he paid so much money because he probably didn't bid for an upgrade in business class. She says, God made it come for you. There are two types of people in the world. There's the person that says, God made it come for you. And the person that says, I made it come for you. Or I made it come for myself. Hashem should bless us to be miracle aware. To be able to bring Eretz Israel into our chutz la'aretz life, into our chutz la'aretz mindset. And when a person lives in that space, then Be'ezat Hashem, we experience not just Eretz Yisrael, but what Eretz Yisrael was always designed to be, the closest place where heaven kisses earth, where God meets humanity, and where humanity recognizes that it was God that was knocking all along. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.